the early adopters and people who kind of got in, you know, we do see some pretty concentrated, you know, allocations towards crypto. I mean, my wife and I mined Bitcoin back in 2014. Our journey starts, you know, a decade ago. I don't know how many financial advisors, you know, had their buddy call them up and start screaming about, you know, internet space money and blockchain technology. And I was just like, it sounds like you're asking for money. What do you want? He's <laughs> like, let's go have these on a miner. And This content is brought to you by VeChain, which is a leading enterprise grade layer one public blockchain spearheading a digital revolution from a sustainable, highly scalable smart contract platform. The VeChain blockchain has many unique features, which makes it an ideal choice for Web3 applications. VeChain is working with many great enterprises such as PwC, Givenchy, BMW, and Walmart China. Most recently, they partnered with the Boston Consulting Group to build a revolutionary decentralized application ecosystem. I'm a big believer in this project. I have been since 2018. I've been a VET token holder for years. And this blockchain is highly scalable, uh, great with security and speed, and it has low energy consumption. If you'd like to learn more about VeChain, please visit vchain.org. Link will be in the description. Welcome to the Thinking Crypto Podcast, your home for cryptocurrency news and interviews. With me today is Douglas Bonaparte, who's the founder and president at Bonafide Wealth. Douglas, welcome. Thanks for having me. Douglas, one of the reasons I noticed you on Twitter, or what Elon calls X now, is you have some great tweets, man. <laughs> you have great engagement. Are you the one tweeting that or you got somebody else helping you with that? Uh, it's all what you see is what you get. Um, all, <laughs> all, all me, all, all those memes and shit posts are yours truly. <laughs> I love it, man. I love it. It's good stuff. Um, before we talk about, you know, investing in Bitcoin and so forth, tell us about your background, where you're from and uh, what's your professional background? Sure. I, I grew up in South Florida, uh, moved down there when I was very young from from New York, ironically, would find myself back in the Northeast over the last 10 years. But I grew up in South Florida um what can i tell you early adopter of all things technology i mean i was very very privileged to have access to computers in my house you know i had a father and a grandfather who knew how to use a computer i think mm. it's probably more rare to have a grandfather in the 90s who is wow. you know yeah surfing the internet the early days i think there was even some day trading he did at some point in time so yeah, my brother and I got our hands on all kinds of stuff. I just wanted to play the video games. My brother took it to the next level and learned a little bit more about programming. And I then joined him on, you know, hardware and building computers. And we actually created a little computer repair business when the PC was really uh, making its way into people's homes. And when you grow up in South Florida, there's a lot of old people around and they were learning how to use computers. So our weekends were uh, filled making good money, teaching people just how to log on to AOL or whatever <laughs> internet provider, you know, they had. Um, so that's what life was like a little bit uh, growing up. It was it was a good childhood for the most part. What's, you know, what's wrong with sunny South Florida? Um, yeah. But yeah, I think I think having that early access really, you know, paved its way for a lot of the stuff we're going to talk about here today. And, you know, I've always been exploring in things that oh, always choosing to be an early adopter of stuff that looked cool. Mm. And what made you want to get into investing in finance and even start your own uh, business? So I grew up the son of a financial advisor. Um, I'm a second generation certified financial planner. Uh, when I was in college, I was having a lot of fun. I came home one day. Uh, after my freshman year, uh, my uh, my dad asked me what I was going to be doing over the summer. I said, I just want to go back to school because I was having a lot of fun uh, at the University of Florida. And he said, well, before you go back up, why don't you see if you can't uh, pass your Series 7? So there was a securities manual on my bed. I said, hey, can think of worse things to do in between, you know, uh, the end of my freshman year and, and the second summer session. And uh, I studied that, I passed that, and really having no idea what to do with a securities license at that time, found myself learning about financial planning and wealth management, um, and spent uh, not only my time uh, in school having fun and learning and getting a degree, but I also worked uh, pretty much full-time 
uh, in my father's practice. So I got a really early start uh, in the profession and the industry around wealth management, uh, ultimately to leave my father's practice um, in 2008, moved to New York City just to watch it all fall apart, you know, really great start to my adult lives. I'm a geriatric millennial, you know, your, eld your eldest of millennials here. Mm -hmm. And uh, my then college girlfriend, now wife, went to New York City to go to law school. I chased her up there. Uh, wasn't really digging, living and working at home after school. So I took everything that my father gave me in terms of knowledge around the profession and moved to New York City to try and, you know, it's so cliche, try and make it there on my own. And uh, a love story as well. Um, and I was able to get a, you know, small salary that could get me a beer on the weekend and pay my bills. I had student loan debt and had to take a loan, you know, from my mom to get rid of my car <laughs> down in Florida, just so I could get up, uh, to New York city. Um, and that's pretty much the start of my adventures in, you know, the Northeast in New York. Uh, it would be several years from that point uh, before I'd start my firm. Uh, but I always knew I wanted to have at least uh, a practice or a book of business of my own. Mm -hmm. um, I worked for a few advisors um, along the way, uh, put myself through business school at nighttime at NYU, uh, and really just did everything I could to figure out how to ultimately build this practice that I have today. And uh, I had this... Uh, this epiphany, this light bulb moment in business school, because I was trying to figure I, I I liked what I did. I didn't want to necessarily leave, but you're, you know, in your mid twenties in New York city around all this pedigree. Mm. Uh, and you got to make a name for yourself somehow. So I had this moment where I said, you know what, no one's focusing on millennials and having watched, you know, my generation go through the great recession and, and really get this, delayed start to our careers and adult lives, I figured if I can invest in us, um, it probably would offer a big reward in the long term, even though we had nothing really to, you know, invest today, you know, invest in then. Uh, but I knew my generation needed help. And, you know, I was, you know, kind of, you know, fitted and suited to be able to do that, having the early start that I did. And uh, a few years out from from graduating, uh, started my family, but also started my firm, and almost exclusively went towards helping high achieving, you know, young professionals or millennials um, achieve their financial goals. And that's how I started Bonafide Wealth. That's amazing. And you know, I'm a millennial as well, so I can relate to a lot of what you're saying. Um, you know, growing up in New York, trying to make it as well. Um, what do you think about a little bit off topic here, but you know, New York, you and I are very familiar with it. Uh, obviously, it's been a bit rough after the pandemic and all the things that have happened there. Do you see it bouncing back? Do you see it coming back to life? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, there's parts of New York that I, it's it's not my New. I spent ten years in the city, right, and managed to leave to the burbs of New Jersey. We just realized we're neighbors. Yeah. Um, we came out here in 2016. So mm -hmm. had a good three and a half years before the pandemic. Um, it clearly shook the city and turned it into something, you know, that is a little, if not a lot different from what I remember. And I'm not sure how much of that is the pandemic versus, you know, New York just changes. Like I, I, I got out at Hudson Yards on a seven train you know, a few weeks ago, and I'm walking to Penn Station to get my my train home. And I'm like, where? And I've been in Hudson Yards before, but I just had this moment surrounded by these new big buildings. You know, there's always big buildings in New York, but these, where, where am I? You know, like, wow. where did this all come from? And just being taken aback once again, that like this city has evolved and changed. Now, as far as like, just the vibes, you know, and people out being out there. Yeah, you know, I go to dinner in the city all the time and, and head in for friends and try and get in at least once a week to my office to, you know, just get away from home. It feels different to me. And I'm not sure if that's because I'm I'm just older and I got kids now. Like my wife and I talk about that. Heather and I talk about this all the time. It you know, the New York we remember is the New York of our young twenties and, you know, early thirties. And I think it's more has to do with the time in your life, you know, than really New York itself. Like there'll always be, 
you know, areas where, you know, you have, it's like you go to these areas and you get nostalgia and fond memories of what you did a decade ago when you were there seven years ago. And it's just, it's just different, right? It's just different today. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, like, I could totally relate with that because in my mid twenties, I spent a lot of time in the city, early thirties working, going out to bars, going out to nice <laughs> restaurants and so forth. And then to your point, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'm also thinking about, is it I'm getting older and now I'm in the burbs and things seem different or that, you know, the economy and the city went through boom and bust cycles. There's different uh, businesses now, there's different restaurants and that happens naturally, you know, through the life cycle of things or, you know, is the, the pandemic change things. So I, I'm looking into the, you know, in New York when I'm there, I'm like, man, things seem so different, but I don't know if it's my personal bias or change being in the burbs or, you know, macro factors. I, I think two things can be true, right? I think we've definitely changed. I also think that New York has changed in that, you know, I, I remember a year or so ago being in Midtown and it's, you know, five o'clock and there should be people all over the sidewalks leaving work on like Park Avenue, you know, out of these buildings, um, packing bars. And it was just quiet, you know, relatively speaking to what I remembered. And I think that's largely because these corporate buildings, and this is really a story about commercial real estate, right? They're just not packed with workers like they once were. You know, the work from home, you know, the reversion to going in the office five days a week. I mean, I, I know a lot of companies have, you know, been somewhat successful in, or in that mandate, but I think by and large, you know, that that hasn't happened. Like this whole return to work thing uh, really wasn't as strong as, you know, people thought it would be. And there's still a lot of remote working. So, you know, in that regard, it was kind of strange to be, you know, on, on an avenue at five o'clock and people aren't like all over. Why is it so quiet relative to my memory of it? So I think uh, there's something to be said about a concern for, you know, how are these, how are these pieces of property going to fare when, you know, we're now no longer in a low interest rate environment and their loans come due and they don't have necessarily the rent roll that they once did before, you know, and if that is a big concern, how big of a concern is it? Does that, you know, create a fracture in the economy? What's going to be the impact of that? So I think everyone's been watching commercial real estate like this slow, you know, that's the one thing, like, everyone knows about this. This isn't like a surprise. You can't call it a black swan event if things get bad. It's just watching this kind of train wreck in slow motion. So it's like, hey, look at that. It's going to hit that thing over there. Just wait <laughs> and you'll see it. Yeah. So in that regard, I think New York has some, you know, real fundamental shifts taking place just in regards to from in regards to a commercial real estate standpoint. And we'll, we'll see, you know, we'll find, we'll find out just how, bad or hopefully not bad that is yeah i was actually about to ask you about that because that is something i'm paying attention to in addition to consumer credit card debt um but the commercial real estate seems like something that there's not way an easy way to fix that to your point because of how the work environment has changed so with that said yeah. is that the a big factor in a hard landing with the fed and that what gets them to cut rates and to start QE again, maybe in 2025. Um, what, what are your thoughts around that? I think everyone's looking for the catalyst to get the Fed to cut rates. I mean, it's pretty much splintered into two directions, right? Things relatively are fine. You know, inflation comes down or continues to come or <laughs> goes back down. You know, a little, you know, a couple prints that weren't so great. Um, you know, jobs aren't hemorrhaging. So the Fed cares about two things, right? Right. You know, inflation and jobs. So let's say those are stable, if not, you know, from an inflation perspective, getting cooler, jobs are stable. Um, all right. Is there a reason to keep rates higher for longer? When, when does longer become shorter, if not, you know, done? So are we doing it? Look, is the economy all right? And we don't need to keep rates high and we can bring them down. That would, you know, be best case scenario or our rates coming down because things got really bad, you know, lot, lots of layoffs, the economy's tightening up, you know, inflation wasn't something that was really 
solved. And uh, I think it's going to be less on the inflation side and more on, you know, maybe. And then to your point, like, is is there a catalyst to this? You know, is this a slow burn into a you know recession and it's a softer landing uh, and we still find rates being cut? Or, you know, does something pop off and we have a mess on our hands? Obviously, I'd prefer that not to be the case. And I'll take anything between things are good and a soft landing if we're talking about the next end of a cycle here. But also, like, 2022 was pretty brutal, um, at least from a market. And I know the markets aren't the economy here, but, you know, there's some wild price action, certainly in the tech space and from a job perspective, Once again, the tech space and beyond, um, there was a lot of retracing of jobs. So, you know, does that mean we got we got room and breath to go? I'd like to think so. You know, things aren't all that bad. I mean, politics are a complete mess, and we're not going to get into that. But and I mean that from both sides here. Uh, you know, but I ask friends who don't work in finance, they're like, everything seems to be pretty good, except. <laughs> You know, what's going on politically? And I'm like, interesting to hear, you know, I'm always talking to finance people. So I wanted just to hear from some friends and folks that, you know, don't work in the space. And their general impression is things aren't all that bad. Mm. So to your point, you know, markets have been ripping, stock market hitting new all-time highs, Bitcoin, of course, going parabolic today. Um So markets tend to be forward looking. So uh, to your point, are they looking ahead and saying things don't seem all that bad? It doesn't seem like we're about to fall off a cliff or something. Do you think that's what's happening here, um, that the markets feel confident? It would seem so the way the way we're, you know, been pushing up from 2023 already up 7%, you know, not including today uh, for the S&P 500, 8% if you're looking at the NASDAQ. I mean, We're not even done with February by the time you and I are talking here. We'll, you know, we'll head into the final leg of the first quarter of the year. And, you know, you're seeing asset, you know, main asset classes continue to pump and surge. Um, it's hot, you know, look, your crystal ball is as good as mine. You know, I can pretty much give you any answer of what my opinion is, you know, moving into the second half or you know the the second half of the first half and then the second half of the year all together you know i'm happy to be wrong but i'm optimistic you know i think it, so here's my opinion i think it does take a look at things not being as bad as you know sentiment would say and i think even sentiment to some degree is perhaps turning around a little bit although uh we didn't necessarily get a good you know read on the sentiment index but You know, are things are our are, are, are friends and family and people we talk to feeling as bad as they were, you know, four or five months ago? I feel like there was a big hangover from COVID and a huge hangover from 2022. Mm. Everyone called for a recession in 23 and it never came. And we're still don't have one here in 2024. So maybe there isn't one. Right. And, um, but at the same time, we can always point to things that look like. Uh, you know, rain clouds, whether we just talked about commercial real estate, whether inflation gets under control, you know, whether layoffs continue to pick up, um, they haven't necessarily been, you know, a bright spot. So it's always a mixed bag. And we're in an election year on top of all that. I think 24 will be a wild ride. Um, but there's some crazy stuff going on at the same time, right? The, the AI phenomenon, you know, if you're a chip manufacturer especially if your name's nvidia or if you're designing chips and your name is arm even amd and uh, other semiconductors you know uh, uh issues are are really having quite quite the year you know quite the last trailing 12 months it's incredible um you know i have some friends who are calling for this being you know the 1995 internet aha moment but with ai Um, I think we're going to see some wild stuff take place over the next 10 years. I'm so bullish about it. I'm excited for it. You know, I'm not an AI doomer. I, I think that will create so many jobs from this. I think it will be one of the most deflationary things we've ever seen. And you got to get excited for that. I mean, if you're here living life just for things to make the same, that ain't, for things to stay the same, that ain't, that ain't all that exciting to me. Yeah, you know, what you mentioned there about 
not being a doomer, I, I think what people get scared of is sometimes the short term pullback of certain jobs and so forth. But what we've seen, the technology eventually evolves and branches out and it creates more jobs. Uh, just look at the internet, right? Internet took away a lot of different companies and disrupted a lot of things, but then a ton of other applications and websites and different more. use cases popped up and created tons of wealth and jobs. Yeah, look at e-commerce and what that has done to just GDP and production altogether. So we lose, you know, traditional ways of doing things. Then there'll be, you know, e-commerce getting turned into something that we hardly imagined, whether it's wearables or the metaverse or, you know, virtual spaces in which to, you know, consume. It's going to be, I don't have all the answers for sure, but it's going to be incredibly awesome. Um, but it can be also very scary for those who feel like they're being left behind and don't have the, you know, know savvy to do it but you know we're talking as young men here i'd like to think we're still young uh and more importantly just digitally native you know one thing i love about millennials uh we have uh the ability to be digital natives we you know we understand what it's like to live in a world that has the internet and one that didn't you know our childhoods weren't for better or worse you know engulfed in you know the information super highway uh, we have a great appreciation for it. And yet we're not, you know, punching away at our keyboards with two fingers because we didn't learn to touch type. We can pick up devices and figure them out real quick. It might be a, it might be our, one of our biggest strengths here is having that balance. And you're seeing some of the things that, you know, the next generation, Gen Z, who's fully indoctrinated into all things digital um, and some of the drawbacks of that. Um, so it'll be very interesting, you know, but they're well poised. They also handle anything, you know, uh, on the digital side of things, maybe even too much. Mm. And I think a great factor that people forget, you have the world wealth of information in the palm of your hand versus boomers and previous generations. If I wanted to pivot and go into a different industry or learn something, it was not easy. Now I can go Google, I can buy a course, I can watch a YouTube video, I can listen to you, Douglas, uh, you know, talk on a podcast. You have, there's so much information now you can pivot and learn uh, um, so many skills. Yeah, it's it's amazing. Our parents had Dewey Decimal System in the library just to go find a book. You know, I, millennials old enough will under, understand what that was because they had to do it too in the lot in their in their elementary school library. But like now, you have a supercomputer in the palm of your hand, capable of bringing you nourishment information and just about anything you want within you know an instant or a day. You can just go on Amazon and order something directly to you. I mean, my kids, our kids, Gen Alpha. You know, we'll see if there's a reversion, you know, to the mean and maybe uh, more of an appreciation like we had. I, I, I have faith in millennials to hopefully balance that out versus, you know, maybe Gen Z, which will have a whipsaw effect from things that were digital, you know, back to things that, uh, that are less digital or more analog. Um, but, yeah, it's it's wild that we have all this and that we can appreciate it. Um it's obviously ser it's served me well in my life, always understanding what's going on on a technology side of things. Yeah, same with me. Now, we're both millennials, like you said, and you cater to millennials. Um, tell us about what you're seeing from their investment habits um, and then you know how that leads into Bitcoin and crypto with the ETFs. Um, what type yeah. of portfolio split are you seeing from these um, other millennials? Yeah, sure. I mean, we're we're a traditional, you know, as much as we cater to millennials, like our our allocation and our models um are pretty traditional. I'm I'm very much a, you know, perma positive compound returns over the long term guy, uh long term time. Um keep costs low, passive indexing. Um these are the, you know, tenants that I abide by to, you know, drive financial plans for clients. I really do think the more you gussy up portfolios, the more opportunities uh, you create to mess things up and, and miss out on returns. You know, slow and steady wins the race. That's that's going to always be my philosophy when it comes to investing. And my clients, you know, bite down on that. They honestly don't have a lot of time, like free time to, you know, parents of one or two, if not three young children running around managing careers man time's a precious commodity people really just want to be able to get advice when they need it have a game plan and invest accordingly 
Um, although I'll say this, you know, millennials are great at, you know, discovering new trends and being in the know. So they've been very open to crypto and digital assets. You know, let's say five or six years ago, one in 10 clients would have a question, a position, uh, or want to know more about crypto. And today I feel like the entire, you know, the entire practice, it's one in four that either have allocation or asking questions or want to know more about it. And now the boomers that we have are getting involved with the ETF, right? They, they now have a easy compatible way to go about, you know, allocating to, to digital currencies and namely Bitcoin. And, you know, that's pretty much what I'm a fan of mostly here. Um, my, my loyalties don't go too far outside of, um, BTC and, and, and sats. So, um, It's really fun working. I mean, I, that's what I chose to do. I, I wanted to work with clients that I could create a relatable experience around, right? To me, that's what it was about. We're all going through this stuff. We're all going through, you know, rearing children and dealing with student loan debt and trying to make a life for ourselves. And for the older millennials, having gone through that rough start in 08 and 09, um, It's been a real joy uh, and nothing against any other generation. I think, you know, there's awesome people all over the place. But as far as where my heart is, you know, and who I want to be helping and who I relate to, it, it was easily my peers. For sure. Um, now, as a millennial, I, I would say I am uh, irresponsibly allocated to crypto. <laughs> and and look, I'm a techie, right? I got into this early 2016 and been dabbling in it, with it for multiple years. So I've been here for multiple bull market cycles. But my wife, you know, she could care less about crypto. And, and we have a, a, an investment advisor and we have a retirement account, a college fund for my daughter and so forth. So I would say I'm 60%, if you pull everything together, I'm 60% exposed to crypto and 40% traditional assets. Yeah. Um, are you seeing that type of split or is it more conservative? Maybe it's 60, 40, opposite, uh, you know, things along those lines. Hi, everyone. Pardon the interruption. I'm Tony Edward, the founder and host of the Thinking Crypto podcast. I have a huge favor to ask you. If you haven't subscribed as yet on YouTube or the podcast platforms, hit that subscribe button, hit the thumbs up button, hit the notification bell on the YouTube platform and on Spotify or Apple or wherever you get your podcasts, please leave a five-star rating and review. It supports the podcast. It allows me to bring great quality content to you. Thank you for your support and I'll let you get back to the content. Yeah, I mean, for the early adopters and people who kind of got in, you know, we do see some pretty concentrated, you know, allocations towards crypto. I mean, my wife and I mined Bitcoin back in 2014. Our journey starts, you know, a decade ago. I don't know how many financial advisors, you know, had their buddy call them up and start screaming about, you know, internet space money and blockchain technology. And I was just like, it sounds like you're asking for money. What do you want? He's like, let's go have these on a miner. And my wife convinced uh, me to do it because I was kind of like, hey, I know how to get my buddy off the phone here. Let me just go ask my wife. And she was like, oh, yeah, go do it. I was like, wow, all right. So great decision, clearly. And I learned a lot over the last 10 years. So I've been in this space for a long, long time. And when I'm out there making jokes or just lightly trolling people, they're like, you don't know anything about this. I assure you, I've been involved likely more than, you know, 99% of the people yeah. uh, even in the conversation or discourse about it. But to get up to a 40 or even 60% allocation to crypto, it's usually from those who started out very early and have this very outsized position because, you know, they hit it. Um, but as far as clients, you know, that we're just getting to a lot of clients uh, and understanding their appetite towards it in their portfolios, whether they want to use an ETF. Um, you know, for the longest time up until the ETF, we really could only educate, right? We can't, we couldn't allocate. There wasn't really the product suite. And I believe that, you know, hey, I'm, I'm self-custody, you know, it wasn't. Yeah, for me, that I, I take a lot of you know those traditional Bitcoiner stances. By no means am I a maximalist, although you know plenty of friends that are. Nothing, nothing wrong with that. I get where you're coming from. It's just not, it's not who I am. Um, but no, sixty to 40, 40 to sixty percent allocated to digital currencies. That would be huge. 
um, more like five to 10 for someone looking to, you know, on an 80, 20 portfolio, maybe there's a 5% slug uh, of Bitcoin there. Mm. Uh, Douglas, you're an OG man. The fact that you were mining Bitcoin back in 2014, that's amazing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> little, known, little known facts, you know, um, I get that. Yeah. It's a lot. It, That's a lot of that's a lot of eighty plus percent drawdowns. I've I've never sold a single Satoshi in in my life. A little bit of dollar cost averaging in over the last few years, but you know, you would say, "Wow, Doug, you really have conviction here. Why not just go all in?" I don't know. I just don't think that's uh, something practical in my life right now for for my family and the business. But uh, there's plenty of conviction there. I'll tell you that. You know, ask me. Again, how many 80, 50, 40, 20% 20 drawdowns I've been through over the last decade. And I think it's enough to make most investors want to puke on themselves. So um, still still hanging in there. I have no no motivation to sell. I have an idea as to you know when I maybe would relinquish something, a number in mind. But uh, outside of that, um, that's, that's the story, at least as far as my position with Bitcoin. Um, and clients as well. They're they're continuing to ask and continuing to inquire about it. And we're continuing to look on, you know, really practical ways to incorporate that into their financial lives if that's something they want. Sure. So I'm assuming you uh, are offering your clients, if they want it, the access to the nine Bitcoin ETFs that are out there right now? Yeah, that's right. If uh, they want to get in, we have no problem making that happen. And we're able to have an intelligent conversation around what that means to the overall um, nature of their portfolio, what kind of risk they should be, you know, viewing that as. And, you know, ultimately, you got the best performing asset class in the last 10 years, you know, um, you know, you got advisors allocating 5% of portfolios to gold or commodity as well. You know, this really isn't In my view, this really isn't crazy at all. You know, you have a uh, an alternative asset class position that's been a performer. Hopefully, it does put a little alpha down in their overall returns here. Uh, I think it's as good, if not better, than gold here. So do the math. You can see where you know my minimum price target would be at some point in time. But nothing happens fast unless it's today and things are just you know popping off. Um, you know, we're back over, we're back over 60 as of the time we're talking. It's crazy. We're, we're less than 10 K from all time highs. You know, you're seeing a lot of interesting stuff happen. Institutions having to go out and buy Bitcoin on the open market because supply, you know, just ain't there. Uh, and a have, and a having, uh, on top of that in the next month or so, Uh, things are going to get pretty pretty interesting, and uh, I was very very excited for the ETF to debut. A little anticlimactic with the uh, little oopsie daisy tweet the day before, kind of took the the air out of the you know a little bit of the wind out of the sails, I guess. But nonetheless, here we are. Um, Grayscale is just about to perhaps flip positive on inflows after hemorrhaging you know from their costs, but. It was it over 300,000 Bitcoins owned by those ETFs or the top three ETFs, which is insane. So there's a lot of institutional buying happening. And a lot of people think this most recent price action is primarily because because of that. And of course, we do, before the show, we were talking about, uh, you know, Coinbase. It, it's not it's not a crypto rally unless an exchange goes oh, down, yeah. at least so. Uh, Sure enough, today, you know, taking again wind out of the sails of a of a really strong alley, uh, excuse me, rally. Um, what's Coinbase going down for a little bit? Love to see it. Yeah, man. It. I was it's having funny. flashbacks to like 2017 years before. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> um, it's so wild. So, man, these ETFs. have been performing incredibly well. I, I spoke to Eric Balchunas at Bloomberg uh, this morning in an interview, uh, well, I yesterday, I published it today, and he was talking about the records it's breaking. Awesome. And, uh, you know, do you think that, when do you think this is going to surpass goals AUM? Um, do you think it happens this wow. cycle or next cycle? Ooh. So we got to get to what, 10 trillion yeah. uh, or something like that? And we're now back well over one. So, <laughs> you know, I think I think passing gold is what, like five to six hundred thousand dollars. You know, this cycle, I mean, I, I, I'm bullish, you know, I mean, sell, <laughs> selfishly, I want this to go, you know, beyond to Mars, forget the moon. So 
I don't, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm 10. The older I get, the more I realize big changes, even though they can happen fast. And the world of finance happens pretty slowly. I'd love to see it. I want to know. I, yeah, we're all going to find out just how far this goes without, again, one of those things where it doesn't matter what I tell you. Um, I want, you know, no one to act on one guy's, you know, opinion, you know, and speculation of where things go. But I think it's going to be super exciting. Can you imagine, you know, and how long does the cycle last, you know, is another thing. We're going to get to the end of the year before we fizzle things out. I don't know if that's enough time to get to be as good as gold, but um, certainly let's break, let's break through a hundred thousand first. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm thinking more next cycle, but because to your point, like we probably yeah. break a hundred K this year, uh, not this year, but this cycle and, And then, you know, it's, it's going to cool down and then next cycle. Well, you're, you, know, you're, you were getting dunked on, you know, or you're so good. You're getting dunked on, you know, for saying, for being one of the guys or girls that was like, it's going to a hundred K. And now like the reality is pretty good. Pretty much could happen this year. We're far off from like people re really, you know, you people be like, I wasn't wrong. I was just early. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Exciting times. I, I, I'm, I'm here to, you know, obviously get financial freedom, use crypto to, and uh, to get financial freedom, pay off debt, pay off the mortgage yeah. and all that stuff and uh, expand to other asset classes, you know, buy more real estate and things like that. So, um, so, you know, I was just talking with my wife this morning. If we had to rethink, you know, it's every, every, every one of these rallies and when your conviction becomes stronger, we uh, were wondering if we had to rethink any price targets we had in mind as far as divesting and, and putting it to use in our lives in other ways. And, you know, and he would say, you know, I was like, well, you know, ma a maximalist would tell you that's crazy. You'd never sell a single Satoshi and you just go borrow again. You'd never sell and just go borrow against, you know, your, your pile here. And, you know, it's hard to predict where the future is going to be, not just, you know, this is where the financial planner, you know, hat comes on and it's like, all right, you know, if we're talking three to five years from now and these price targets, you know, would you ever really sell something? It's hard to understand where you're going to be at in life. You know, I think a lot of people's inclination is like, wow, that's a big number. You know, I can change my life for the better if I, you know, literally, you know, sell this and go pay off the mortgage, send kids to school, pay off student loans, buy that new house, you know, hard to predict, you know, and then what, watch, you know, watch another five X over the next few years. <laughs> These are tough decisions to make, but look, this is what we help people do for a living. For sure. And, and to be fully transparent, there's some, I'm not selling that I'm leaving for my daughter, honestly, like on a awesome. hardware wallet, not yep. touching it, but I have a, a, a bag that I'm, going to take profits and use it accordingly. And it's not to go buy a Lambo, but it's to get, you know, like <laughs> all of crypto, Twitter and DGENs, Lambo, Moon and all that stuff. But it's more. Yeah, no, no. We talk about freeing up cash flow with, uh, you know, she went to law, Heather went to law school. I went to business school. We took out multiples of six, multiple six figures in student loan debt that fortunately we got, you know, caught up in a low interest rate environment and have been able to refinance that. But you flirt with this idea of, you know, you could be debt free and you could free up that money and use it in other ways. And then, you know, like the finance nerd in me is like, bro, this debt's under 3%. Like you got seven years to go. Your business is doing great. And, you know, you can manage these payments. What are you, what are you talking about? Right. <laughs> so the constant weighing up of these yeah. things, it, it always happens too, yeah. you know, it, it wouldn't, this, this is a very traditional conversation to have in personal finance, regardless of, you know, Bitcoin entering, you know, the uh, equation. What if you came into a windfall or just knocked it out of the park with a stock or, you know, something like that, um, or got a big bonus. These are the same considerations anyone would be making. Yeah. And, and I think something that got me thinking, and even my wife, we have a close friend, um, he's a realtor. And and unfortunately, he got a a sickness, um, incurable. And talking to him, you know, he's not thinking four years from now, he's living in the moment. And yeah. um, I know those things put into perspective, because you just don't know what tomorrow holds. But if you can uh, get yourself more financial freedom and get a better quality of life where you're not, debt yeah. is not hanging over you. I would say go for it, but you know, everybody's different and, and just depends on your financial situation. But for me, I want to get rid of as much debt as possible so I can 
go have more vacations and uh, feel more financially free and do more of what I love versus, and obviously you're doing that with your business, right? But not everyone is in that position. They may be working in a job they hate and things like that. Um, let's see here. What do you think about, I know you're, you're not so much into altcoins, but what do you think about the Ethereum spot ETF and maybe that getting approved this year? Yeah, that's inevitable. I think whether it's this year or next year, you're going to see it. Um, I was having drinks with a friend uh, on, on a group text. He's a tried and true maximalist. Doesn't like it. the first time I heard someone just ardently say they, they don't like Ethereum. But no, I I liked playing around in 2021 with NFTs and proof of work concepts. And you asked me about there being an ETF for that. Yeah, that that's going to happen. I mean, doesn't that kind of open the door for some kind of like money printing by an institution that's issuing an NFT because of the ability to stake that Ethereum, you know, earn, earn a yield on that and pass a dividend on to like the shareholder and take a spread. There's a lot, a lot of mechanical stuff that like is very interesting when it comes to that. Um, but, uh, do hold a, a good amount of Ethereum as well. Um, so I'm rooting for it. I, I just think, you know, as much fun as I had in, in the world of monkey JPEGs and pixelated animals and NFTs and profile pictures, um you know there's probably more you know there's probably deeper uses of the technology than that you know uh internal blockchains for proof of work i mean we're talking anything from verifying luxury goods to you know who last touched an insurance policy from an underwriting standpoint you know private blockchains used by corporations with their own private tokens i mean the creativity of how to use this type of stuff is endless you know i think ethereum just kind of opened our eyes to this type of stuff but it went down the degen too much liquidity rabbit hole right <laughs> and there's so many ways people were just making money in in all kinds of nefarious you know rug pulling scams that wasn't great but we learned a lot and you know we the collective we learned a lot from all of this stuff and i hope the next iteration of of web3 you know is a little bit more fruitful than where we left it on this first go around and, and it will be there what's that have to do with an etf i mean geez once you get the institutions involved here as well I mean, we'll we'll have an idea as to which way things are going to go, you know, just based on what we're witnessing with the Bitcoin ETF. For sure. And look, I, I love this technology. I love this asset class. It's fun. It's integrated with internet culture and meme culture and much more, right? It's, it's a blast. But yep. there are rug pulls, there are scam coins, and there are a couple bills in the House, a couple bills in, in the Senate looking to put the guardrails in place. Um, I don't know if you've been keeping up with that or, or anything, but you, you think we might see regulations this year or, or next year? Yeah, I don't know the last time I really dialed into, uh, you know, crypto regulations other than, you know, uh, grayscale SEC, you know, going at it, ultimately losing in court. And here we are. We have the ETFs now. Um, I'm not not against regulations that will ultimately help investors and people stay safe and secure. I'm it's a little dubious as to whether or not the current, you know, political system we have and the people, you know, making decisions uh, know what the hell they're talking about. And I don't just mean yeah. with, I don't just mean with uh, crypto. <laughs> I mean just in general, half the time. So, yeah, you know, we're not gonna we're not gonna go down that uh, road too much here. But it's just a giant mess and. I hope, uh, you know, if it was up to Elizabeth Warren, there'd be no, you know, crypto or Bitcoin altogether. And I just don't think that's a, you know, smart or informed decision. Uh, it's interesting. You got, you know, BlackRock out here and Larry pretty much being like, this is digital gold, really promoting the product because they have one. Um, but you got Jamie Dimon, on the other hand, who would say if he was, you know, the government, he would just nuke the thing yet. I'm sure, you know, his bank is doing whatever they can do to make money on the backs of, you know, digital currency. As long as there's a market, um, they're going to trade it and be a part of it. So all these figures and all the, yeah, you know, everyone's saying and doing something different. 
Um, I think you should just do your own research and figure out what's best for you, your family and your portfolio and, and act accordingly. Mm. All right, Doug, I got some wrap-up questions here for you. First, if you could create your own metaverse, what would the theme be? I'd be vaporwave. It'd be like totally 1980s vaporwave retro with like pinks, blue, purples. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be like a 1980s mall. I mean, there's a lot of like retro wave, like Instagram accounts I follow. I'm Me too, totally, man. yeah, totally obsessed with, you know, all, all of that. So my metaverse would be very, very much in blues, purples, and pinks. Yeah, dude, I it's funny. Uh I follow quite a few of those retro <laughs> accounts Yeah, under they're the all, 80s themes and yeah, so they forth. kicked Yeah. the 80s, 90s kid in me. It's, it's Yeah. awesome. Yeah. I mean, maybe because we're we we're both born in the 80s. Um and uh I just appreciate 80s music and and you know, even All movies right. and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, rapid fire questions. Favorite food. My daughter would say it's soup. <laughs> she's not she's not wrong, but it's probably anything crustaceans, shellfish, crabs, and lobster. Uh, there's not a seafood tower I wouldn't absolutely demolish. Same. Uh favorite musician or band? Oof, Daft Punk and uh anything electro is pretty much what I gravitate towards. Nice. Favorite movie? That's a tough one. Uh And you know, you gave me these ahead of time. You think I'd have an answer to like just give give you right give you right now. I don't know. I don't know. I can't I can't give you the movie right now. It's 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 evading You gotta do me. it. I watch so much streaming stuff now. It's like all all the good movies, you know, have just flown out of my head. Favorite book? Let's go with maybe Brave New World. Mm. And when you're not working at your wealth uh, advisory, financial advisor uh, company, what are you doing for fun? Yeah, um playing with my kids. You know, I'm a big family man, big family guy. Um, but if it's not that, I'm sipping on tequila and searching, searching that's the that's this current cycle's hobby is looking for just some good additive free tequilas to sip on and enjoy. Awesome. Douglas, pleasure chatting with you. We'll love to have you back on in the future. And uh, uh, those of you millennials listening and watching, go check out Doug's services if you're in the tri-state area. Or Doug, do you service the entire U.S.? Oh, we're countrywide, man. It doesn't matter. Come check it out. It's Doug Bonaparte on any social media handle, all the link tree stuff's there. This was a lot of fun, Tony. Thanks for having me. Glad we discovered we're neighbors, and I'd love to come back if you'd have me. Awesome.